Okay, uh, let's get started then. Hello everyone, um, my name is Michael Holmberger and I'm um, the host for today's um, Dementia Open Forum from uh, the University of East Anglia, uh, which is sponsored by Alzheimer's Research UK. And um, today we have uh, Emma Flanagan speaking to us about a, cr a cranberry study she ran and she can tell you all about this in detail. So um, thank you for joining. Now, just for uh, talk etiquette, um, just remember to keep your microphone switched off during the talk so we don't have any additional noises. And please keep your video switched off during the talk as well. And then uh, if you have any questions for the, it would be a question and answer session after the talk, you can either click on the chat in your meeting control toolbar and just type in your questions or suggestions in that chat if you want to. Um, but there, if you don't want to do this via the chat uh, and you want to ask your question in person, then at the, in the Q&A, switch on your video, but keep your microphone off. And then um, I will ask you to switch on your microphone to ask the question. Um, and if your question was not answered or you want more information, then you can email us on the uh, the, our email address, dementia.research at uea.ac.uk. And we put that email address later on in the chat at the end. So you, you know, um, you can email us as well if you had any questions. But uh, without further ado, so we have now Emma talking to us about the impact of cranberry polyphenols on the microbiome and brain in healthy aging. So my great pleasure to have Emma here, who is just well, ju just about to graduate from her PhD, finished her PhD at UEA. And so it's great to hear all about the work she's done over the last uh, years. So over to you, um, Emma. Hi, thanks, Michael. Um, I'm just going to set up my screen. Hope this goes all well. And can you see that okay? Yeah, that's great. Oh, now I'm back out of the presenter mode. I know what I've done. <laughs> that was a mistake. Okay, sorry. Try again. Um, there we go. Is that all right? Yes, that's great. All right. So today I'm just going to talk through. Um, a project that, we, that I did as part of my PhD, uh, investigating the impact of cranberries on uh, brain function and microbiome function and structure. And I'll talk to you um, about what we found as well. So due to advances in medical science and socioeconomic uh, conditions over the past century, especially in developed countries, people are now living a lot longer. So the WHO predicts that by 2050, 22% of the world's population will be over 60 years of age. Despite this triumph in extending the length and quality of our lives, the gain in life expectancy um, carries with it the increased prevalence of age-related chronic disease. Aging is the greatest single risk factor for the development of neurodegenerative conditions, such as uh, Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. And these conditions present a great personal and societal burden. Although a, a normal degree of cognitive decline is to be expected with aging, uh, it's a significant loss of function and self associated with neurodegenerative disease, uh, which poses a highly detrimental cost to individuals and their families. So human, in co human cognition and um, cognitive decline can be influenced by a number of factors such as disease, age, genetics, so excuse me, and also lifestyle. Um, the exact disease mechanisms causing conditions such as dementia are still being figured out um, and can't be explained entirely by genetics alone, with the vast um, number of cases being sporadic and having no clear family or history or genetic mutation. Despite the growing burden of age-related neurodegenerative conditions and cognitive decline to date, there are currently no effective pharmacological treatments beyond the palliative to slow or stop the progression of the, of the mechanisms causing these conditions with existing treatments often targeting only single aspects of the disease. This is in spite of 
significant effort and resources having been invested over the last few decades to try and identify a cure for dementia. And this is largely, again, owing to the fact that the exact mechanisms underlying these diseases are still being understood. Uh, as a result, um, attention has turned to alternative me methods of combating neuroge uh, neurodegeneration, which ideally are low cost, safe, um, and easy to implement, that ideally target multiple factors contributing to the disease process. And the increasing understanding is that the disease process of leading to dementia can long precede the symptom onset. So this has led focus to shift from identifying the cure um, to more preventative uh, preventative approaches before the onset of the disease. Um, in particular, lifestyle interventions uh, could provide a solution as it is increasingly, increasingly being understood that some of the risk factors uh, for the development of age-related neurodegeneration can be modifiable. Um, neurodegener uh, nutrition in, in uh, particular has started to receive more attention as a possible method of protecting against disease risk and uh, progression. And if it's shown to be effective, diet interventions could provide a viable method of improving quality of life of people with dementia and even prevent or uh, slow existing uh, disease processes directly. Certain nutrients and dietary patterns have been identified as well to um, exhibit protective effects against some of the mechanisms that causes decline, um, such as improving cardiovascular health, uh, neuronal signaling and function, and in particular, the diversity and health and function of the gut microbiome, uh, as well as improving outcomes of cognitive performance and reducing risk of um, disease onset. So in particular, dietary nutrients such as flavonoids um, have started to receive more attention due to their proposed ability to target several mechanisms underlying or believed to underlie um, neurodegeneration. So over the uh, last decade or two in particular, um, there's been increasing attention devoted to the potential benefits of flavonoids per, for preserving cognition and slowing aging and disease processes. Um, so flavonoids are organic compounds found in, in a variety of foods, but particularly fruits, vegetables, um, and some beverages such as tea and coffee and chocolate as well. Um, flavonoids comprise a large group of about 6,000 different compounds found in the human diet, and the amount of flavonoids consumed by individual people can vary widely and depends greatly on the types of diet that they have. Um, so in the UK, the main dietary sources of flavonoids uh, are non-alcoholic beverages such as tea and coffee, and then after that, it's usually uh, chocolate and fruit juice, and then um, fruit and vegetables more generally. Um, a number of studies have found associations between certain dietary flavonoids and chronic age-related diseases, uh, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancers, um, osteoporosis, and uh, neurodegenerative uh, diseases in particular. So there's, there's growing evidence that fruit and vegetables could counteract age-related decline in cognition in both normal aging and dementia, and reduce the risk of and delay the onset of these conditions. Um, the types of flavonoids found particularly high in high concentrations in berries, um, such as anthocyanins, which are also largely responsible for the colour of berry fruits, um, have been found to relate to a range of health benefits, and they can be consumed safely in relatively high concentrations as well. Um, and the consumption of berries has been found to relate to better cognitive outcomes in both animal models and in humans. So there are a few main mechanisms by which flavonoids are considered to exert their health promoting benefits um, or anti-aging benefits. Um, so the first is classically antioxidant effects, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Um, effects on inflammation and neuroinflammation, cardiovascular health, and also modifying intracellular activity. Uh, so these mechanisms uh, don't contribute to age-related disease in isolation, and in fact they're the relationships between these mechanisms uh, can be bi-directional and they can exacerbate each other. Um, another mechanism could also be by interaction with the gut microbiome and gut bacteria, which I'll explore in a bit again in a bit more detail. So 
oxidative stress is a particular interest to aging, particularly um, pathological aging and cognitive decline. The beneficial effects of flavonoids has classically been attributed to um, them having antioxidant activity. Um, they've been linked to a capacity to scavenge free radicals directly in vitro. And this has been the primary mechanism through which they've been considered to exert their neuroprotective effects. Uh, however, the concentrations at which flavonoids exert this antioxidant activity in, in vivo studies, sorry, in vitro studies, I have to say, um, may be much higher than is actually achieved through normal human diet. Um, also, many flavonoids have limited bioavailability, uh, particularly after they're metabol metabolized by the liver and gut, which reduces their availability uh, to exert antioxidant, antioxidant effects um, beyond these organ systems. Um, the bioavailability of many flavonoids, as they normally occur in the body, is far less uh, in far less quantities and for a shorter period of time than that of other nutrients that can have antioxidant effects, um, such as vitamin C. Um, and so the mechanism by which flavonoids exert their beneficial effects on aging and age-related disease in particular may not be due um, to the reduction of um, the impact of oxidative stress, um, or at least it may be difficult to attribute these effects to flavonoids over other nutrients present in the same dietary sources. So cardiovascular health is particularly vital for maintaining brain health as the brain is very densely uh, supplied by intricate vasculature necessary to provide the high oxygen demands, um, which is required for neural functioning. Uh, cardiovascular health is not just important for car preventing cardiovascular disease itself, but it's also been, been implicated in other age-related conditions, in particular, in particular neurodegeneration. Um, so vascular dementia and cognitive deficits following strokes are probably the most obvious examples of this. Um, and there have been findings that flavonoid-rich diets are associated with lower cardiovascular risk through, for example, um, lowering blood pressure. Uh, in addition, uh, higher overall consumption of fruit and vegetables has also been associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease, which has largely been attributed to the abundance of bioactive compounds, in, in particular flavonoids in these foods. Um, Observational data uh, has also suggested there's a link between increased metabolic markers and poorer cognitive um, performance, and that there's a close link between vascular risk factors such as hypertension, uh, higher cholesterol, particularly LDL cholesterol and lipids, and body mass index, and the onset of age-related neurodegeneration condi uh, neurodegenerative conditions, um, including uh, a mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, and vascular dementia. Um, there's also evidence that uh, flavonoids, especially the ones found in berries, have beneficial effects on increasing blood flow, including in the brain, which is vital for cognition and brain function. And flavonoids may also be beneficial to health and function of blood vessels, uh, which can also be adversely affected with aging. Um, there's also evidence that consumption of other flavonoids, such, such as those found in citrus fruits and cocoa, um, relate to changes in cerebral blood flow in human subjects uh, with effects measurable even after, even quite soon after um, consumption. And there are very few studies um, so far investigating the impact of berry flavonoids on neural functioning in humans um, as measured using functional neuroimaging techniques. Um, another mechanism is um, by modulating intracellular activity. Um, so this includes affecting neuronal receptor activation, um, modulating gene expression and signaling proteins. Um, and the activation of these signaling pathways are particularly important for modulating synaptic plasticity, um, long-term potentiation and memory. So improvements in memory is uh, considered to be due to enhancing growth and connectivity of synapses uh, and controlling neuron survival uh, in response to things like neurotoxins and uh, inflammation. Um, the main mechanism through which they work is by in influencing signaling, signaling pathways which um, regulate gene expression of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, um, thereby, thereby modulating neuronal survival and synaptic plasticity. Um, BDNF is a protein uh, that supports cell survival and growth of brain cells and their connections and has an established involvement in learning and memory. 
And uh, conversely, the reduction of uh, BDNF has also been linked to uh, Alzheimer's disease and neurodegeneration. Um, and increased uh, BDNF is associated with slower cognitive decline uh, in Alzheimer's. <coughs> However, um, in humans, this has uh, not been really looked at uh, by too many studies, particularly in the context of very lebanoids. Um, so there's still very little evidence for how this impacts things like BDNF in, in humans. Uh, so finally, the uh, human gut contains trillions of microorganisms, uh, including bacteria, fungi, and viruses. The role of bacteria in the gut in supporting human health is only beginning to be understood uh, thanks to new techniques allowing us to identify these microorganisms as they exist in the gut of living people. Um, whereas previously these microorganisms were not believed to have a significant impact on health, except in the case of things like um, stomach bugs, now the functioning of the gut microbiome is uh, beginning to be understood to have a critical role in promoting health, uh, including brain health. As such, there's been a recent explosion in focus on the gut-brain axis and um, the complex bi-directional relationships between the functioning and health of the brain and the functioning of the gut and the gut microbiota. Uh, the gut and brain communicate by several pathways, including directly via the vagus nerve and as well as peripheral signaling by neurotransmitters and the immune system. Sorry, that's my cat. Um, the neurons in the gut, otherwise known as the enteric nervous system, are estimated to have as many neurons as the cat's brain. Um, it's quite on time. And uh, furthermore, about 90% of the body serotonin is made in the digestive tract, much of it produced by gut bacteria. So attention's turned towards how, um, how modulating the function of the gut and its communication with the brain could improve conditions such as mood disorders and dementia. So the com composition of intestinal microbiota uh, also changes with aging, uh, which could partly due to changes in diet, um, as well as things like reduced immune system function. As such, it's been suggested that um, changes in the gut microbiome could at least partly con contribute to the mechanisms that cause age-related neurodegeneration and in turn, um, by improving the, the functioning of the gut and the gut microbiome, uh, we could support brain health across the lifespan. Um, there is also evidence that dietary flavonoids can impact the activity of gut microbiota um, and the main mechanism by which they do this is by changing the different strains of bacteria in the gut. Uh, particularly, they can promote the health, the, the growth of supposed friendly bacteria and inhibit the growth of less beneficial strains uh, and also increase the diversity of bacteria in the gut. So for example, um, proanthocyanids found in cranberries are believed to inhibit E. coli in the urinary tract. And this is furthermore attributed to the unique structure of um, flavonoids found in cranberries compared to other dietary sources of, of these flavonoids. Um, so how this translates into action of cranberry flavonoids within human gut still remains to be fully determined. And in turn, um, the intestinal microbiota play a crucial role in metabolism of flavonoids. So the digestion and, and breaking down of flavonoids, which are not usually digested directly by the human digestive system. And in fact, it's estimated that between uh, 90 and 95% of flavonoids really reach the colon um, undigested, uh, which is where they are expected to undergo further metabolizing and fermentation by gut, micro gut microbiota. Um, in some situations, flavonoids can only exert beneficial effects after they've been metabolized by specific um, bacteria in the gut. And these flavonoids and their metabolites can't be fully used by the body until they've been metabolized by gut microbes. So much of the evidence regarding mechanisms by which flavonoids exert anti-aging effects come from preclinical studies, um, so in vitro and animal studies. So the effects of these flavonoids in humans is only beginning to be understood. Um, furthermore, a lot of the evidence in humans comes from epidem epidemiological and observational studies. And although these studies can provide uh, really valuable clues as to how diet can relate to health outcomes, uh, particularly over the longer term, uh, they can only provide effectively uh, correlational evidence. 
Um, it's also often difficult to isolate the effects of specific compounds or dietary component, components in um, observational studies. Um, so RCT or randomized control trials um, provide more information regarding the effects of specific nutritional changes on disease and cognition. And, and cognition. <clears throat> um, so whether or not the effects on cognition in particular are found can also depend on the accuracy of the measures used. So for example, uh, results will depend on the specific um, cognitive domains being investigated and the sensitivity of these tests. So speed of processing versus overall cognition. Um, as some types of cognition may benefit more from more than others from certain dietary interventions and compounds. Um, additionally, the particular study population included could affect results. Um, so study populations can vary greatly um, due to, to a variety of factors such as age, um, the degree and duration of their disease, if they have one, um, presence of other illnesses or other medications, um, all of which can affect nutrient absorption. So other confounds exist that could affect um, the results, and, and these can also include things like geographical location, um, physical activity levels, sleep, social and economic status, um, comorbid diseases, and also genetics as well. So just uh, to sum up, uh, so flavonoids uh, could prove to be positive methods of protecting against age-related uh, decline in disease. Um, and although this has classically been attributed to them exerting antioxidant effects, other mechanisms may be responsible for their health benefits, such as uh, modulating inflammation, um, improving cardiovascular function and risk factors, um, intracellular activity, and interactions with the gut microbiome. Um, so further clinical studies investigating the effects, effects of flavonoids on these mechanisms in humans is, is required. Which uh, brings us to our study. So we wanted to investigate the impact of cranberries, um, which are quite high in, in certain flavonoids on the microbiome um, and brain in healthy older adults. So we aimed first to investigate the impact of a cranberry intervention over 12 weeks on microbiome composition and metabolism, and also investigate the role of modulating the microbiome and, meta and metabolism. <coughs> in mediating the effect of the cranberry intervention on cognition and brain physiology. So participants took part in the study for 12 weeks and they were either given a cranberry, well, a cranberry powder, it wasn't so much a supplement as a freeze-dried uh, powder or placebo. Um, so they either received the sachets of freeze-dried cranberry powder or um, a placebo, which was matched for taste, color, and, and micro, macronutrient content. So the intake um, per day was roughly equivalent to one cup of cranberries. Uh, and both, it was double blinded. So both participants and researchers were, were blind to the treatment allocation. So we were recruited people through um, existing studies at UEA. Um, within the Dementia Research Network, and also through the Joint Dementia Research website, which is very useful for um, finding uh, participants, particularly healthy participants as well. So the inclusion criteria, um, age between 15 and 80 years old, uh, generally fit and healthy. Uh, they were willing and able to provide written and informed consent in English. Uh, so fluent in written and spoken English, normal corrected, to normal vision and hearing. And uh, we also tested at baseline that their intake, or sorry, screening, I should say, that their intake um, per day of flavonoids was less than 14, uh, 15 portions. So we also took height, weight, and blood pressure. Uh, so we calculated BMI as well. Um, and background questionnaires included uh, background diet through a food frequency questionnaire. Um, sleep questionnaires, uh, some questionnaires on physical activity, um, questionnaires regarding uh, mood, so particularly depression and anxiety, and also subjective memory performance. So participants rated their own day-to-day um, -day memory performance on a questionnaire. So we did a, a, a battery of certain cognitive, of, of different cognitive tests, looking at um, a few different domains. 
So we looked at overall global cognition, um, some tests of episodic, episodic memory, um, executive function and working memory, and uh, spatial navigation as well. We also did neuroimaging. So this included both structural and uh, functional neuroimaging uh, sequences. And we also collected blood stool and urine samples. So um, we did screening hematology, looked at things like liver function and just general blood biochemistry. Um, we looked at markers re relating to lipid metabolism, such as cholesterol. We looked at markers of neuronal activity, uh, such as BDNF. We also looked at um, gene variants found related to um, uh, neurodegenerative conditions, such as APOE. Um, we looked at uh, gut, ba uh, gut bacteria species compositions and also flavonoid metabolites post digestion as well. So from recruitment, we screen people over um, the telephone just to check the main exclusion criteria and get verbal consent. At the screening visit, we obtained consent, um, did a cognitive screen, uh, took the physical measurements, took blood samples and urine samples. And then they, uh, participants were invited back within a few weeks to the baseline visit where we did a more in-depth cognitive battery, um, took the physical measurements again, took another blood sample, which was sent to the labs for, for more detailed analysis. Um, we took urine samples, stool samples, and we also conducted an MRI. Um, we then sent participants off with either the cranberry powder or the matched placebo for 12 weeks. Um, and they were instructed to take it twice, twice a day for those 12 weeks. And then after the 12 weeks, we followed them up with a, the same cognitive battery as baseline, um, physical measurements, uh, blood samples, urine samples, stool samples, and an MRI as well. So results, um, the placebo and cranberry groups were very well matched at baseline, for the main demographics, so age, gender, and education. Um, the placebo and placebo, uh, sorry, the cranberry and placebo groups were also quite well matched for almost all the baseline characteristics um, and measures such as sleep, physical activity, and mood. Sorry, excuse me. Um, there were very minor differences detected for estimated daily vitamin D intake and liver enzymes as well, but these were not outside um, normal ranges. So I guess the biggest finding, first of all, was that we found an improvement in episodic memory and performance as measured by the ray complex figure, delayed ray call. So basically people um, are told to copy a picture, quite a complex picture, and then that picture is taken away and then, then they're asked to um, recreate the picture from memory um, after a delay. So uh, these improvements in episodic memory were in line with other similar interventions um, of a similar length, so 12 weeks or around 12 weeks um, in old adults, um, but usually with early memory changes and involving other types of berries such as uh, blueberries and concord grape, which is also high in anthocyanids. Um, surprisingly, we didn't find any impact on other cognitive domains. So um, working memory and executive function did not improve over the intervention in the cranberry group. So other studies have found improvements in working memory and executive function uh, with similar uh, types of interventions. So this could in part relate to the distinct uh, flavonoid composition of each intervention, or it could actually, in my opinion, be more likely a product of cognitive test choice as well. So um, we also didn't find any effects on spatial navigation. Um, so there aren't very many other studies looking at spatial navigation. Um, there have been some looking at whether um, observational findings of lower ratios of omega-6 to omega-3 relate to better for performance in virtual uh, navigation tasks, but um, nothing uh, to my knowledge in other noise. Uh, then the cranberry intervention also, as expected, had no impact on structural gray matter or um, degree of white matter hyperintensities, but there was um, a relative increase in blood perfusion detected in the cranberry group as a result in the, of the intervention. Sorry, excuse me. Between baseline and follow-up compared to the placebo group, so we found um, improved brain perfusion in um, or increased brain regional uh, perfusion in the entorhinal cortex, the chordate, and the nucleus accumbens 
So the entorhinal cortex forms part of the medial temporal lobe and it's in a collection of structures which um, are implicated in supporting memory function, um, which relates well to our findings of improved memory performance. And the, uh, the chordae and the nucleus accumbens form part of the uh, striatum. And although their relationship to cognitive aging and neurodegeneration is less specific, um, they do form part of a frontal striatal circuit, which, or, or part of several circuits which underpin cognitive um, effective and motor processes as well. So uh, we didn't unfortunately find any impact of the cranberry on BDNF as measured in plasma. So previous studies are uh, focusing on the impact of high flavonoid intake from fruit and vegetables more generally have found a positive increase. Um, uh, but another study of a, similar, of a similar length didn't find any uh, changes in BDNF. So it can be quite, the findings from other human studies are quite few and inconsistent as well. Uh, a possible reason for this could be um, that a high concentration of BDNF was measured at baseline particularly in um, the placebo group, which might have masked the over impact of the cranberries follow-up. It could also be that we, so we lost 14 participants to follow up due to COVID restrictions. So we didn't collect blood samples over that period. Um, so it could be that we just didn't have enough data to detect any differences. Um, so yeah, it's, Another reason could be that the baseline concentration in the placebo group could have been related to participants having a higher consumption of caffeine as measured by the um, food frequency questionnaire, but this didn't reach significance and it's really just speculative. Um, so we're not really sure. Uh, we also observed a significant decrease in LDL cholesterol following cranberry intake, uh, along with a trend in total cholesterol decreasing. Uh, but we didn't find a similar decrease in HDL or uh, good uh, cholesterol, in inverted commas. Um, so these results are in line with previous studies that found that cranberries um, were effective in reducing cholesterol and lipid profiles, um, particularly LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol. Um, interestingly, when we split the data by gender, um, cranberry intake seemed to benefit better older male participants, which had a, a more of a steep decrease in BMI. Um, and similar parameters were also better controlled. So there seemed to be a bit of a gender difference as well. Um, so such results are also in agreement with data demonstrating the anti-obesogenic impact of cranberries, or suggested impact. Um, although again, much of this evidence is derived from animal studies. In terms of gut microbial changes, um, so many of the changes that we found uh, due to the intervention were detected from the order level down. So um, where dietary interventions have been found previously to impact the gut microbiome as measured in feces, it's often at the species and genera level um, and often and less often at the phylum levels at which the microbiome uh, tends to be a lot more stable over the longer term uh, and in, in response to the intervention. Uh, furthermore, the results uh, from the beta diversity analysis indicated that there wasn't really a clear Clustering of samples based on the treatment, which might indicate that the differences between our samples were caused by um, bacterial species and genera spread out amongst different phylogenetic groups, um, rather than all clustering within one family, um, order or class. Sorry, excuse me. Um, many of the bacterial populations which we found an increase um, were associated with the microbial use of flavonoids, which is quite interesting. Um, so in particular, there was increases in microbial abundances in Agathocelli, Agatha, sorry, I'm not very good at these, Agathocelia <laughs> and Coriobacteria families, uh, which are both implicated in the degradation of polyphenols. Um, so these furthermore have been uh, shown to produce uh, bioactive secondary polyphenol metabolites. Um, and these bacterial populations have previously been found to change in abundance following uh, wild blueberry and also cranberry fruit powder interventions in uh, animal models. Um, so the anal analysis of, analysis of um, metabolic phenotypes showed that there were several metabolites produced in the cranberry group 
that could impact um, brain function and cognition, which ties in nicely with our um, findings for neural changes, and neural functioning changes and cognition improvements. So um, key metabolites were found to relate to uh, delayed memory performance in the Cranberry group, including for HIPAA 8 and TMAO. Um, so TMAO is metabolized by, uh, from choline by microbes and has also been suggested to protect the brain by supporting the integrity of the blood-brain barrier and thereby uh, improving cognition. Um, the relationship between the shift in bacterial abundances um, and microbial produced metabolites was further supported as well in the findings in the Cranberry group where there were significant models detected for metabolites um, relating to the um, species that were found to be improved, uh, increased in abundance in the Cranberry group. Um, so that, was, that tied in quite nicely as well. Uh, finally, um, the circulating plasma polyphenol metabolites um, indicated that both groups were well matched at baseline, apart from the flavonoids, uh, apart from flavonoids, which were a bit higher in the placebo group before the intervention. Um, and there wasn't really a clear reason for why that was. Um, so the results of the background questionnaire um, also indicated that the placebo group had a higher average intake of flavonoids. Um, the difference wasn't significant, but we're not quite sure why the placebo group had um, otherwise a higher um, flavonoid, flavonol intake at baseline than, than the Cranberry group. Um, there are also, there, so there are overall increases in total metabolites in the Cranberry group uh, as a result of the intervention, which also indicates good, good compliance. Um, and it appeared to be driven largely by increases in catechols and eupuric acid. Um, interesting, there was also a significant decrease uh, in catechols and valerolactones. Um, in the placebo group as a result of the intervention. Again, the reason for its for this isn't really clear, but it could be due to the dietary res restrictions that we put on high flavonoid, uh, sorry, um, high flavonoid foods during the intervention. So we ask participants to restrict, restrict intake of things like berries and grapes and chocolates um, during the intervention, just so that it didn't confound um, the results. So this could be one reason in the placebo group why we saw a decrease because it wasn't being supplemented by the cranberry intake. Um, so the plasma polyphenol metabolite concentration also didn't relate, unfortunately, to um, memory performance. Um, again, uh, it could be due to um, uh, not having enough um, data as a result of um, the, the data lost follow-up. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we didn't find any relationships between um, metab plasma met metabolites and memory function. So possible limitations of the study. So um, it's, it, this was done as a feasibility study. So um, even though the size was comparable to other studies which found significant results, um, the sample size could have been a limiting factor for some of the outcomes that we looked at, particularly since, as I mentioned, um, we were impacted by COVID-19 restrictions. So during that period, about 14 participants' data wasn't able to be collected. Um, for uh, MRI scans, blood samples, and um, some, cognitive, some cognitive tests as well. Um, there could be also the impact of other non-polyphenol nutrients um, in the background diet or within the cranberries, which could be exerting these effects. So we kind of made the assumption that it is the polyphenols um, exerting the, the beneficial effects on, on the outcomes that we looked at. Um, but we didn't measure background intake of things like omega-3 fatty acids. And we didn't um, also take a serum sample, uh, do serum measurements of, of um, other nutrients, which we suspect could be uh, impacting cognitive function. Um, and there's also other mechanisms such as uh, chronic neuroinflammation, uh, mitochondrial function, and compromised vascular integrity and function. Um, which could also relate to um, the changes that were detected. Uh, it, we just didn't um, measure those because the focus of this um, study was the impact of the gut on the gut microbiome and uh, cognition. So um, conclusions. Uh, so we did uh, find improvements in memory and neural function as a result of the cranberry intervention. 
which in turn related to beneficial shifts in the structure and function of the gut microbiome. Um, so uh, the results of this study provide uh, a promising basis for the investigation of the dosage and uh, duration of dietary cranberry intake required to uh, produce similar benefits to neural function and cognition in larger trials, um, and particularly to determine whether these changes persist over the longer term. Uh, in particular, replications of these methods in a larger sample size might also produce more robust results than what we found, uh, for example, particularly for the neuroimaging findings. Um, so future studies um, could also investigate uh, this in larger samples and also in clinical populations as well to see whether these changes translate into the context of um, clinical uh, cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. And yes, that's it. <laughs> so I'm just gonna stop. Um, so thank you for everyone, particularly the, um, the combat participants who gave up a lot of time and were very compliant with taking the cranberry powder over the 12 weeks as well. We had a really high level of compliance. So um, obviously we can't do this research without the participants who take part and to everyone else who, who contributed to the study as well um, and to the analyses. Great, thank you very much, Emma, for this overview of your PhD. A uh, big, uh, you know, very large study, obviously for PhD. So that's great. So if we have any questions, could you please put them into the uh, the Q and A, and we can go through this. Um, or alternatively, yeah, if you just want to come on uh, in your video and then ask your question in person, I'd be happy to do that as well. Um, or the, I think you can also put it in the chat if you want to. So maybe I can kick us off. So, well, in general, so do you think it's then worth it doing, doing scrambles on a practical level? People want to in, improve their kind of cognition to take cranberry more. Yeah. So I, I guess um, with cranberries, one of the main considerations is its palatability and astringency. And, you know, it's a lot of there's been a lot of studies in things like blueberries and other types of berries, but there's been a, a lot fewer studies in cranberries. So that was kind of the point of this uh, feasibility study as well was to uh, measure the compliance to taking the cranberry. And as I said, um, so we had two main measures of compliance. We measured how many sachets were left over at the end of the, at the, end of the intervention. And we also measured um, the uh, metabolite levels in plasma as well. So I and urine. So we, we had good measures of compliance um, and the cranberry group did show a lot high uh, polyphenol um, metabolites in, in the samples that we looked at. So yeah, as much as it, so I think raw cranberries as well is also another barrier. It's not very often that people would have raw cranberries. So I think the, the way that we presented the cranberries in the freeze dried powder um, made it a lot easier to incorporate into diet. So the way I would usually suggest that the, for participants to take it um, just as a fallback if they didn't have other ideas for it was just to dissolve it in water as you would a tea. And that was, um, when participants were reported back, that was one of the most popular ways of taking it. And it was very easy to take as well in that way. Uh, another way was um, it was very in, in, easy to incorporate into things like yogurt and desserts. Um, so yeah, we didn't find too much of an issue with uh, it not being as palatable a fruit as maybe some of the other berries that you might might be able to take. So yeah. Yeah, yeah as you said, it's quite sour. So that's the, the danger is always that people put a lot of sugar on it. <laughs> and it kind of might actually have not that beneficial effects if yeah. you should definitely reduce your sugar consumption. Well, there is a difference as well in, in studies between how they present the um the cranberry. So cranberry juice is another and, and sweetened cranberry uh, are the ways that it's presented. But we the way we um gave it to participants was minimally processed and minimal additives as well. So you kind of it more pinpointed the impacts of the cranberry itself rather than maybe something else that's going on. Great. And so, and do you think, you know, people who are maybe at a higher risk of dementia, for example, do you think they would still benefit somehow from this or, yeah? 
Um, in terms of people who may be high risk due to genetics, um, so we did look at genetics um, in the samples that we collected and the distribution was similar to what you'd find in a normal population. We didn't have anyone who was at particularly high risk, so we didn't have anyone who carried both alleles of B4. Um, so it was, it's kind of hard to say whether um, from our study, whether it might have protected against those that are genetically higher risk. Um, this is kind of, a, th these kind of interventions target um, early disease processes, I think as well. So more preventative, um, it's more of a preventative approach rather than something that you would use to target people who um, are probably later stage in dementia as well, because at that stage, the mechanisms have been well underway and, and uh, not something that can be physically reversed by this kind of intervention. Yeah, but I mean, in particular, the cholesterol was, I guess, interesting in that sense, wasn't it? So people have maybe high cholesterol and that might yes. increase their risk for yeah. cardiovascular disease or dementia. So other than, yeah, the genetic factors, the more lifestyle factors as well, um, mm. which kind of just fits with um, the growing understanding of the different lifestyle um, and the kind of complex interaction between different lifestyle factors towards the development of some of these chronic conditions such as dementia. Um, kind of all interplaying, so diet and, and um, cardiovascular risk factors and, and sleep and mood and these kind of things as well, sleep and physical activity, these sorts of things. Great. Do we have any other questions? Anybody wants to come on or put something in the chat? Please feel free to do so. I think um, well, we're having Emma still here. So do you think without uh, COVID, you would have, you know, this, a lot of this was like a statistical power kind of issue that you didn't get enough people at the end. In some cases, yes. So for the neuroimaging results in particular, we had some findings that, that were on the cusp of significance, particularly for um, prefrontal regions, which would be expected to maybe be more vulnerable to aging. Um, so we did find um, just below some, uh, statistical significance for some of those regions as well. So it could have been, but maybe not certain that if we had more people who, um, so say if people were able to have their follow-up MRIs um, and not be impacted by the COVID restrictions in that respect, we might have found something potentially. Yeah, um, of course it's speculation, one never knows. COVID yeah. hit us all a bit. Yeah, yeah, I can't, yeah, yeah. It's not something that you can entirely blame on, on COVID. So it was, um, there were statistical trends um, for a lot of the outcomes, which suggest that maybe if there was there were more um, data points that we might have found something significant. Yeah. Okay, Russell, do you want to come on and ask your question? Thank you, Michael. Um, I have put something in the chat about dietitians and whether they should be involved providing specific advice to people living with dementia, as they do with people with diabetes. I mean, personally, I take a cranberry supplement because I have a renal condition and susceptible to urinary tract infections. So, uh, well, for me, it works really well. Do you know what I mean? And I also do drink, of course, a lot of fluids. But just going back to people with living with dementia, should dietitians be involved more? I think that's kind of the ultimate goal of these kind of studies is to... Um, develop a, an empirical base to, to base um, advice and guidance off for, for people um, from, from, clinical, uh, from clinicians such as dietitians. So that's kind of the goal, um, these findings. And, you know, obviously we need quite a, a, a lot more studies to, to say for certain um, or to, to give concrete guidance. But yeah, that's, that's the goal ultimately. Um, but it does have to be evidence-based, which is why we run these studies. Okay, thank you. No, I think that's a, that's a really good question. Ideally, yes, uh, dietitians would clearly help, but it's very tricky, isn't it? And particularly with the supplements, always we don't know. Some supplements are very specific, as Russell said, for, you know, there are tract infections, but others we don't know yet how they work, or it's more diet-based. Oh, we have a, another question, um, which was um, whether Souvenade uh, actually contains cranberry or fruit extracts, because that 
of course, Suvenate is, is advertised for, for MCI. Do you know that, Emma? I don't know if it contains cranberry extracts. I know that it is uh, a concoction of several. Um, I think it has omega-3 only, if yeah. I remember correctly, but I'm not sure about the polyphenols. But it's no, a really good question to, to look that up. Uh, Suvenate, of course, is, uh, if people who don't know this, this is a kind of a supplement drink uh, promoted by a company, which is a subsidiary of Nestle. Um, which um, is supposed to help cognitive function um, and the data, yeah, it shows that people benefit somewhat from it, but it's not clear, I guess, <laughs> as much as, as it could be. So there's more, more studies are needed, but Suvine takes the approach of taking all the supplements that are known to be kind of affecting, uh, supposed to be affecting dementia progression and puts them together. So it's a great question. I guess we can find that out whether there is cranberry or fruit extract. I think, as I said, omega-3 is for sure in it, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. I I'm think it's sure. one of these things where it's the difference between the specific nutrients and um, the whole food within, you know, within which it's it's delivered. So um, things like fiber as well and other nutrients that are found in something like a cranberry could also be contributing, especially for the gut microbiome. Um, so to isolate the compounds may not have the same effect as if you had the whole food itself. Absolutely. No, that's a great question. Okay, do we have any other questions? If uh, not, uh, I just want to point you out um, our, uh, so our, um, Next meeting um, is um, in September, so after the summer, and we have Anne-Marie Minahan talking about nutrition and brain vitality. We are what we eat. So Anne-Marie is really specialized in, in more nutrition approaches with brain aging and health. And she's run one of the, well, the biggest so far um, Mediterranean diet and physical activity trials across the UK. So she got, I think she's going to talk about this. How much does this make a difference? really promising results so it's really interesting to see that how we change our lifestyle really impacts our our health and um so that's really great it would be great if you can join us and we can circulate of course the information as always via the usual channels if you can join us again this would be on zoom um so that would be great and um Russell just asked the final question whether we have these lectures soon at UEA again. And that's a very good point, Russell. We've been exploring this actually. So we, we, we're going to, to see if we can do that, but it will be very likely only in the next year. This year, the university still takes, takes quite a conservative approach of having many large lectures, especially inviting a lot of external people who come to the university. Still very difficult, but yeah, we're working on it. Let's put it this way. So let's just thank again, Emma, for her talk. And um, yes, I hope to see you soon and hope to see you in September and um, enjoy the summer. <laughs>